Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There is a saying that you can tell a great deal about a person and how they pray to God. When you examine the prayers of people or your own prayers, they reveal a great deal about you spiritually. And this is certainly the case with one individual. And I'm speaking about King David. Many people would say, oh, I would love to be king like David was, to have the various things that David enjoyed. But David suffered greatly. David endured many things. And these hardships, these times of despair, David being under attack by others, all those things, they were not pleasurable, but they strengthened David's faith. So remember something. When you're going through a difficult time, when you feel that you are under attack, realize that at those times, God can be teaching you, He can be preparing you, training you for something in the future. And God, He is going to be faithful if we turn to Him and say, O oh Lord, you are my help. You are my defense. You are the rock of my salvation. When we turn to God with those types of statements of faith, and we believe them in our innermost being, and we turn in biblical truth to God, we can expect, we will experience God's saving help in those difficult times. He is indeed a deliverer of his people. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 35. The book of Psalm and Psalm 35. We're going to look at the first half of this Psalm and this study, and we're going to see that indeed David is experiencing trials. There are many individuals who have risen up against David, and we're going to see a, a phrase, and it's a word which means bechinam, which means without cause, without reason, without any justifiable reason they've come against David. And the answer, why does this happen? It shouldn't surprise us. But whenever someone is walking in obedience, whenever someone is doing the will of God, obeying the truth of God, the enemy doesn't like it. And therefore, that enemy will stand in opposition. He will move those who do not have a covenantal relationship with God or walking in the truth. He will move them against the man of God, the woman of God. So as we walk in obedience, we should expect there's going to be those attacks from the enemy. He is going to launch those fiery darts, those missiles against us. But the power of God can extinguish all the attacks of the enemy. And David turns to God in confidence. So that is an admonition to you. That when you are in the midst of an attack, realize God is able to be your defense. He is greater than anything that the enemy can lodge against you. Let's begin. Psalm 35, the first thing we see here is La David, which means of David. Indeed, David is the author of this psalm. And it says here, as David is petitioning God, there's a word. And he says, contend, 
O Lord, against my contenders. Now, this word contend, it is a word which means to, to be at conflict. And David says, and it's in the plural, there are those who are with conflict with me. They stand in opposition. They are moving against me. They are contending against me. And David is petitioning God in prayer that the Lord, that he would contend for him against his contenders. And then secondly, he says in this same first verse, it's a word for warfare. One who conducts a war. So it's a, a soldier or a warrior. And he basically says, be a warrior against those who war against me. The warriors who set themselves against me. So David, what's interesting, David, one man, but he has many who are contending against him, many who are waging war against him. One man against many. David doesn't have many people on his side that, that are helping him, assisting him. Many times David is, is fleeing alone, and the only one that he can turn to is the Lord God, for God's help, God's assistance. He says in verse 2, strengthen the shield, and he uses a, another word for a shield. Now, one may be a larger one. One may be one that is used also to attack, but it's two weapons of warfare. And David says, strengthen, and how we can understand this is in a way, strengthen my defense. David does not want the enemy's attack to, to be lodged in a successful way against him. So he's asking God to, to strengthen those things that protect him. And then he says, and rise up with my help. David is petitioning God for assistance, for help. And again, we see that there's no other place that David can turn to. Many individuals, and if you study David's life, many individuals have turned against him. They have seen that David has fallen out of favor with King Saul, with other individuals of great significance, those who have an important role, position in the kingdom. And because David is a person that many have turned against, more and more are joining his opposition. Why? Because it's the expedient thing to do, to be against those who powerful men are against. David he, he feels alone in one sense. There's not many allies on his side. So David turns to God. Not as a last resort, but he realizes his absolute necessity, his dependence upon God. And it's good that we realize this, not because all other means of assistance are used up, but we should turn to God first. David prays in a mighty way, in a confident way, and he says in verse 3, and this is a word for to, to release. It's a word that speaks about a, a spear, removing it from its sheaf, and he says, and close, this may be more in the sense of stopping, cutting off, close, and the implication is the way for those that are, are meeting David. And the ones who are doing that in the end of this first section of verse 3, it's a word, wrote phi, and these are the ones who are David's pursuers, those who are pursuing me. So David says, bring their pursuit 
to an end. Cut them off. Close them. Stop them in their objective to, to capture me. To, to take me in. He says, say to my soul, you are my salvation. Literally, it says, say to my soul, your salvation, I am. Who's the I here? God. So David wants God to reaffirm that, that David's salvation is the Lord. And I think it's so significant, this word salvation, oftentimes it's simply a word of deliverance. It's a word of victory. It's a word of overcoming the attacks of the enemy and the purposes of the enemy. And what David wants, and I believe this is a, a big deal here, David doesn't want to be defeated because David wants to accomplish the things of God. He wants to be used by God. And therefore, he does not want the enemies to succeed in putting him down so that he cannot serve God. David is not thinking about his own interests, but the interests of God. And he says, look at verse 4, may they be ashamed, and there's two different Hebrew words that, that really speak about the same thing. Being ashamed, they're synonyms. So he says, be ashamed, and again, let them be ashamed. Who? Those who seek my life, my very soul. And he says, cause them to flee backwards and to be ashamed. Now, this word for, for be ashamed at the end of this verse it's another word. We have the word busha, cherpa, and a third word that all speaks about shame, being in a way of, of being discredited, a way of, of showing uh, uh, a, a embarrassment for wrong behavior. So this is what David is asking God to do to show that their actions actually lead to shame being placed upon them. Verse 5, let them be as a, a chef before the wind and the angel of the Lord that he pushes or drives away. So we see in a very real way, that David realizes in the same way that you take that, that, that grain, that, that piece of wheat, and in willowing it, we see something, there's a separation. And that, that which is separated, that klipa in Hebrew, that, that piece is easily driven away by the wind. And what David is affirming is this, God is able in the same way that, that a, a wind can easily blow away that, that chaff, in that same way, God is easily able to move the enemy out of my presence, push him into oblivion, bring about this one's destruction that he would never be seen again. So David, in this, this fifth verse, is attesting to the confidence that he has in the Lord. Look again. Let them be as a chaff before the wind, and the angel of the Lord, may, may he drive, drive them away. Verse 6. And their way may be darkness, and also slippery. And this is a word, this word for slippery is a word that implies that a fall is coming. It's a word that depicts danger. So let their way be a way of darkness and a way of danger that they slip. And the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord pursues them. So again, David twice has, has testified of his faith that God can dispatch angels, 
And many times this angel of the Lord is, is spoken of within the context of salvation, victory, deliverance, overcoming. And this is exactly what David is revealing to us here, that God is able to send that angel in order to ensure that there's victory, that there's deliverance for his people. Verse, verse 7. Now we hear of this word, chinam. Oftentimes it's also bechinam, which is mean without costs or without reason. And David, what he's saying is that he's innocent. These who are rising up against him, David hasn't done anything against them. David hasn't done anything that warrants this behavior. What David has done is submitted to the purpose of God, and that and that alone has brought about this attack upon his life. So there's no justification for David being under attack. And because God is a righteous God, he's a God of justice, David expects that God will move. And so he says, look at verse 7. For without cause, they, they hide. They conceal themselves from me. And their, their net and pit. Now, what this is, is a way of capturing. They have set a trap for David. They are waiting in ambush for him. And all of this, David hasn't done anything to, to justify such behavior. And he says, without cause, second part of verse 7, without cause they have dug, and the implication is dug that pit for my soul or for my life. So once again, David is saying over and over, the enemy has gone to great lengths, great extent in order to capture me and bring me down into the pit. Now, this word for pit is a significant word because it speaks of a place of retribution, a place of judgment, and what happens is this. The enemy, because of our faithfulness, our obedience, our submissiveness to the things of God, the enemy wants retribution against that. They cannot, the enemies of God, they cannot tolerate the obedience of the people of God. And they want to bring oppression, adversity, hardship, retribution upon the servants of God. And notice what David says in verse 8. He says, a destruction, and it's the word shoah, which is the ancient word that's used in Hebrew today for holocaust. So a great destruction, let it come upon him that, that he will not know. So David is praying to God, God, let there be, a destruction, a, a total annihilation upon him that he doesn't know that's coming, that he's not expecting. What we learn is this. When a person is in disobedience to God, walking under the deceit of the enemy for the purposes of the enemy, that person, is going to be totally unprepared for the judgment of God. And that judgment of God is going to come about in a great day of destruction and annihilation for those who are against the things of God. Look now to the second part of verse 8. His net, which he has hidden, let it capture him. And this, and it's the second time we have the word show off for destruction, a total annihilation. He says, in destruction, let him fall into it. So in destruction, let him fall there. 
So David wants the enemy to experience that same desire and what they want to do to David, let it be turned upon them. And what David realizes is a biblical principle. The measure that you measure with will be measured back against you. The sword that you use to slay one, that same sword will slay you. And it speaks about simply a day of God setting things in order. And David is saying, now is that day in my situation. In the plight that I'm in, I need God to move in this mighty way, to bring about great destruction of my enemies. Verse, verse 9. Now there's a change. Instead of David petitioning God, David moves in this verse into praising God, adoring God, rejoicing in the presence of God, David has, and here's the key, a confidence. A confidence that God's going to do just that. Be his defense. Set him free. Give him victory. Cause him to overcome all these, these plots against him. So we read in verse 9, my soul rejoices in the Lord. Not in his circumstances, but in the Lord. And he says, you cause joy in, in, or rejoice in his salvation. So over and over, David is expecting deliverance. And David is saying, you're the cause for joy because from you is salvation. Verse 10, all my bones, they will say, O Lord, who is like you? And this implies that the Lord, he is God and there is no others. Now, I want to pause for a moment. Because oftentimes people are confused. When, when God speaks about other gods, that you should have no other gods before me, people will say, well, it, it implies that there are other gods, but God needs to be first in our life, and there should be no other gods in our life. But there are other gods. No, they're not. There's only one God. The reason why God deals sometimes in this language when he speaks about Elohim Acharim, other gods, is because there's other religions, there's other gods that people worship, but there's no reality to those gods. All of that worship, all of that activity, Satan claims for himself. So there's only one God, but there is an enemy. Hasatan, the devil. There is that demonic world, fallen angels, evil spirits. And what David is telling us is that even though all of that dominion is there, God's power renders that dominion null and void. God, his name shares that he is without limitation that he trans all, transcends all things, and all of the enemy, they are limited. They are beings which are restricted. They are not omnipotent. They are not omniscient. And they will not be successful. So we, in Messiah, this is why David says in this, this great verse where he speaks about uh, my soul will rejoice in the Lord. It's in this covenantal relationship that we can be assured and we can rejoice in his salvation. That's why all of our bones will say, O Lord, who is like you? And the implication is there's no one like you. And who is God? Look at the second part of verse 10. We have the word matzil. Matzil 
In, in modern Hebrew, it's the word used for a lifeguard. But the word matzil, it's a noun that's derived from the verb, which means to, to make delivered, to cause to be rescued. So in this case, it's one who rescues, one who delivers. This is God. He is a deliverer for his people. So David says in the second part of verse, verse 10, a lifesaver for the afflicted one who is stronger than him. So this one who's being afflicted and those who are afflicting him, they're stronger than him. David is saying, I'm going through a hard time in my life. There are those that are bringing affliction to me. I'm an afflicted one. And the ones who are doing this are greater than me. But that's okay because God is my lifeguard. God is going to rescue me. He is going to deliver me. So David turns consistently unto the Lord for deliverance. So a lifeguard for the afflicted one, because greater are those than him, meaning than David, and the poor one and the destitute one. God is a savior for those as well, from those who, and this is the one, it's a word for stealing but oftentimes it's stealing by force. It refers to those who want to oppress, one who wants to inflict pain, suffering. And the the message here is that, that the one who has no physical resources, no earthly help, God's going to respond against those who are doing the affliction, the oppression. Verse verse 12, David cries out. He says, false witnesses rise up. And this word for false witness really isn't false witness, although some Bibles translate it this way. It's a day Hamas. Now, literally, this would be violent witnesses. And these are the one, and the commentators say, These are the ones who speak deceit. They lie. They are indeed false witnesses. And the objective is to cause suffering. They're not interested in the truth. And this word Hamas can be that which depicts one who enjoys violence. One who rejoices in the pain, the suffering, the adversity of others. So David says, these witnesses of violence, they rise up. What? And their testimony is the implication. He says, I have not known. I I don't know what they're talking about, what they are asking me. So David is like being, being examined. And there's all this information being leveled against him, these accusations, these words of slander and such. They're being leveled against him, and David doesn't know what they're talking about. He's not able to defend himself. He doesn't have any information about them because they're all rooted in deceit, lies, and they're all for the purpose of seeing David suffering, David being oppressed. And again, what we see here is that David is saying, there's there's no one that's supporting me. There's no one that's helping me. And the only one that I can turn to is God. But you know what? He's enough. He is able No matter what the enemy is, no matter what the odds are, God is greater than all of them. Verse verse 12. They 
pay me evil in exchange for good. So David says, they, they recompense me evil for the good that I do. David practices good unto them. They return, they pay out to him evil. And what is their objective? It says, shechol lenafshi. Here, this is a word for, for an intense sadness, a, a grief, a despair. Now, learn a very important principle. The enemy, they know the power of praise. They know the power of thanksgiving, gratitude. They know how God responds quickly to those who praise him, thank him, glorify his name, bless his name, rejoice in his presence. And that's why the enemy, he wants to cause us to have a a grief unto our soul, that that inner being is full of despair. Because when we are full of despair, we're going to begin to complain, We're going to feel that uh, life's unfair, and it may be. And we're going to become discouraged, and discouragement will lead to doubt. Doubt will cause us to, to struggle in faith. And when we struggle with faith, our perspective is going to be clouded. It is going to be darkened. We're not going to see things accurately. We're going to make poor decisions. Those poor decisions are going to lead us away from the provision of God, the power of God, and we're going to be in a weakened position. That's what the enemy does. The enemy wants us to to be full of despair. So David realizes that. And he says, look again at, at our verse. He says, I'm doing good. And they return to me, they pay my goodness with evil. And that's all for David to fall into despair. But notice what he says in verse 13. But I, in their sickness, now he's talking about what David has done in the past to these same individuals that are against him. And if you read, First and Second Samuel, well, you'll find that some of, of David's confidants, David's friends, his allies at one time, they turned against him. They cursed him. And David is saying, these are the people, notice verse, verse 13, but I, in contrast to how they are behaving against me, but I, when they were sick, he said, my, my clothes, what I put on was sackcloth, meaning that, that David mourned, David grieved, David interceded. He says, I, I afflicted myself in fasting. When I say myself, it's literally my soul. So David says, these individuals, when they were sick, I put on sackcloth and I fasted in behalf of them. And now, what are they doing? They are are attacking me. They are slandering me. They are making false statements against me. All of this. He says, therefore, look at the end of verse 13. He says, my prayer unto my my bosom, my, my chest, let it return. David here is saying, during the time of their suffering, their hardship, when they were going through difficulty, perhaps sickness, David says, I prayed for them. I fasted for them. I mourned for them, repented for them. I was loyal to them. And what have they done? Betrayed me. So David's saying, let what I prayed for them let it return unto me. Let it come unto my situation. Now, isn't that a great thing? That that you can say at times, God, 
just as I prayed for other people, would you hear those same prayers that I made in behalf of them? Would you hear them in light of my need, my situation, what I'm going through? But if you're not praying for others, you can't expect God to carry out those things in your life. Finally, look at our last verse, verse 14. David is restating what he has been to these individuals. He says in verse 14, as a friend. This is not the normal word for friend, but it's a word for, for a close individual. This same word can be used for a spouse, for example. So a person that has a close, a close relationship, a very, very, very personal relationship. He says, as a friend, even as a brother unto me, I, I walked. Now, this can be understood in two ways. It is in a unique construction, what's called the hitpa'el, and it's the word for walking, but in this sense, it can refer to walking consistently. Consistently, David can says, you know, these individuals, I have consistently behaved as a friend, as a brother unto them. Now, the second way can be understood is that this same word, can be referred to kind of pacing back and forth. And when they were in trouble, David was saying, you know, I just didn't ignore that. But as we've said, he put on sackcloth, he, he fasted, he prayed, and the idea is that he paced back and forth. He was concerned. He was burdened for them. This is what David behaved like for his friends. And now they have turned against him. So he says, also, like the mourning of a mother. Now, this, this can be the mourning that one would, would display for their mom, or it could be the mourning that a mother, a mother would have for, for a child. So he's saying when they were going through hard times, when they were experiencing hardships, incidents of despair, defeat in their life, he says, I was grieved in their behalf as a mother grieves their, their children. And he says, I was, the word koder is a word for, for gloomy, it's a word that, that depicts kind of a, a blackness that just comes over someone. A, a atmosphere of despair, sadness, grief. And this is what he says. And the last word here is a word for, for bowing. And it could be thought of in the sense of David saying, when I heard what happened to them, I felt so, so much despair. There was just a heavy gloom that came over me. And I was led to, to place myself prostrate on the ground. And the implication is to intercede for them, to lift them up. And now David, these same individuals that David was so faithful to, these are the ones who have turned against him. Now, there is an important takeaway from that fact, and that is, don't blame God for the disobedience and the betrayal of others. I believe that there are signs that tells us that we are moving to a, a unique period of time, and that is getting close to the beginning of the birth pains. And in the midst of that time, Messiah makes it very clear that there are going to be children that turn against their parents and parents that turn against their children. Fathers against sons, mothers against daughters, daughter-in-laws against mother-in-laws. And what does the scripture say? The scripture says, 
the enemy of a man will be the members of his own house. So don't be surprised when people that you have loved, that you have blessed, that you have lifted up and upheld in prayer, that you have assisted them perhaps financially in some other way, soon that they might turn against you. That we, because of our faith, we are going to become hated by the world and the leaders of the world. Those things that we hold dear to, those things that we see as right, the world's going to say they're wrong. And those things that we speak against as wrong, as abominations, the world is going to embrace. Don't let the betrayal of others surprise you catch you off guard, cause it to be a time of despair, realize this is the time allotment that we're going into. And what we need to remember, and this is what I'll close with for this first half of Psalm 35, what we need to remember is this, God, if we are in a covenantal relationship with him through the blood of his only begotten son, Messiah Yeshua, and we are walking in fidelity to, to his word, don't worry about the attacks, the slander of the enemy, them laying in ambush for you, the weapons that they have, the adversity and oppression that they can throw against you. The slander, the lies, the false testimony, don't be concerned. Realize, write down right now, the days are coming soon when I will be viewed as an outcast, that I will be seen as a bad person, as a bigot, as a narrow-minded one, as someone who is, is from the dark ages, someone who's an enemy, someone who is deplorable, that's okay. Because we are not seeking the approval of the world. No, we want to be approved by our Lord. So David understood this. David wasn't surprised by this. But what did David do? He turned to God for God's assistance. And that's the wisdom that we need to remember as the days, as they are turning dark. I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.